So my goal today is to convince you to stick to a gluten-free diet. So the big disclaimer is that I don't have celiac disease, so I cannot pretend to uh, understand the struggles that uh, patients with celiac have on a daily basis. Uh, but I think we all get it, that it's hard. It's hard to stick to a gluten-free diet. Um, I'm Catholic, I try to give up uh, chocolate every Lent, and it doesn't work. And I cheat, and then I think God is gonna forgive me. Uh, but the small bowel is not very forgiving, so we have to take care of our small bowel with our gluten-free diet. So the goal of today is really to try to convince you and to show you the data that we have um, about uh, how important it is to uh, maintain a strict gluten-free diet and maintaining a healthy uh, small gut. All right, so you all know what celiac disease is. This is usually a slide I put up for my GI fellows and students. Um, so we have an autoimmune disorder uh, of the small bowel that occurs in people who are genetically predisposed. And the important thing here is that this is the only autoimmune disorder where we know what is the trigger, the environmental trigger. So the good news is we know what causes it, and in theory, it's simple measure that we need to take. It's just to remove the gluten from the diet. I know it's not simple, but think about all the other autoimmune disorders out there where we don't know what triggers them. So you, you've seen all ads for psoriasis and rheumatoid arthritis and Crohn's, and usually at the end of the ad for a medication, it says, talk to your doctor if you have this and that, and this might cause cancer, lymphoma, infection, tuberculosis, hepatitis B, etc. Okay? So think about it in a different angle. Yes, it's hard to be on a gluten-free diet, but compared to other autoimmune diseases where we are treating these diseases with potentially toxic drug, we have a good solution for now, and hopefully we'll have better solutions later. Um, but that's an, a different way to look at things. So what happened in your gut when you eat gluten? And this is, uh, sounds like a little bit of a medical slide, but it's, I think it's important to visualize what happened in the small bowel when you're eating gluten. So the small bowel li layer, lining, is made of one single layer of cells. And these cells are stuck together, okay? They're actually standing guard against anything that the body should not have inside it. And, but also, these, these cells have to be smart enough to recognize the nutrients that we need to absorb. So they need to be permeable enough to bring in nutrients, but also stop anything that we don't need. But if these tight junction between cells are broken or not very functional, the gluten would get under these cells. And there's an enzyme there in that tissue that changes the gluten form and make it recognizable by what we call antigen-presenting cells. These are cells that recognize that complex of the gluten that's been modified, the enzyme stuck to, to it, and these cells will present that, present that complex to the cells, um, the lymphocyte, that if you remember your biology, these are the cells that are involved in the immune system and inflammatory response. So these T cells would get activated and start producing cytokines. Cytokines are molecules that activate inflammation, and this inflammation will destroy more of the small bowel. So we get into that vicious cycle. Our small bowel is a little bit fragile, get the gluten in, reaction happen, cytokines get secreted and cause more damage of the small bowel. So now the small bowel cannot do its function. It's leaking out nutrient and it's not, absorbing, it's not able, capable of absorbing nutrients. So this is how a small bowel looks by endoscopy. Who had an endoscopy here? Most people, right? Fun experience. Those gowns are very glamorous when you wear them, right? Uh, so uh, the small bowel looks beautiful in my gastroenterology opinion. And the first part of the small bowel, that's what we call the duodenum. And this is uh, the part of the small bowel that gets, that receives most of the gluten. So most of the damage will occur there. And that's why your endoscopist will biopsy that part of the small bowel, the duodenum. This is what it can look like when you have celiac disease. So um, smooth folds when things are normal. And in patients with celiac disease, it might still look normal, but often we see changes. It looks scalloped. It looks like somebody took little bites from them. And this is really a manifestation of that layer, of the, uh, uh, the, the epithelial layer being damaged. And on biopsy, so on your left is a normal small bowel. So the small bowel is responsible for absorbing nutrient. And in order to increase the surface of absorption, God created these villi. These are like finger-like protrusion that increase the surface of absorption. So instead of having a flat surface taking care of things, you actually increase the surface of absorption. To your right, you have a biopsy of a patient with celiac disease. Things become flat, so your surface of absorption decrease. 
and the bile looks inflamed. You see a lot of purple cells. These are lymphocytes. These are the inflammatory cells in there. And the reason I put that in is that it's important to visualize that when we're eating gluten and we have celiac disease, there's true damage that occur in the small bowel. So the pathologist might, will send us back a report saying this grade one, two, or three, three being more severe. But the thing to remember, there's not a good correlation between symptom and the severity of the damage. So I've had patients tell me, you know, when I eat gluten, it's not a big deal. I, I don't feel much. I feel maybe a little bit bloated, but it's not. So I don't think it's really harming me. You know, I, I'm fine. Well, there's really no correlation. You might have minimal symptoms, but you might be damaging your small bowel in a significant manner. So how common is celiac? We always think of it uh, as a Caucasian disease. I'm happy to see different colors, different people here. That's wonderful. My patients with celiac are from Ghana, from India, uh, from, uh, from the Middle East. It's a universal problem. We used to think of it as a disease of North European uh, uh, Caucasian descent, and it's not. This disease is very common all around the world. One to two percent of the population. If you do a blood test, serology blood test, or endoscopy on everybody in a country, you'll see that one or two percent of, of, of the population will have celiac disease. So how come my clinic is not filled with patients with celiac disease? Because we have that celiac iceberg. So there's only a small percentage of patients that has symptoms that are significant enough that they seek medical care. And a fraction of these patients are lucky enough to find a physician that tests them for celiac and make the right diagnosis. So if you're in this room, chances are you're lucky that you were diagnosed uh, and then you can get treated because you'll see those silent celiac patients make the majority of celiac patients. And these are patients that have damage of the small bowel, but either have no symptoms or minimal symptoms that didn't prompt them to seek care, or if they sought care, the physician didn't think it was a big deal, all right? And these are people that are maintaining their bowel in a damaged state. So we're all familiar with the classic GI symptom, the diarrhea, the, the weight loss, the, the malnutrition, the bloating. And usually the more the, the symptoms are severe, like with any disease, the more likely we are to treat it, right? The more likely we are to seek care and to stick with the treatment. But 50% of patients with celiac disease, and I'm sure there's a lot of you here in this room, have more subtle symptoms, or uh, you know, like a fatigue, or maybe some hair loss, or ulcers in the mouth. And so you might not seek care, or when you seek care, your physician might tell you, well, that's normal, or you're fatigued because life is stressful. Uh, or you're losing hair because you have too many kids, you know, whatever it is, right? Uh, so, uh, so there's a lot of good excuses, and these are the patients that are high risk of having long-term small bowel damage, or once diagnosed, I think these are the patients that have more tendency to cheat or not be strict because the symptoms are more subtle, not prominent. The interesting thing is there are people that are asymptomatic, and they did studies looking at these asymptomatic patients. So usually these are people that were diagnosed with celiac disease because they had a family member with celiac disease. And so we do the blood test, and it's positive. We do the endoscopy, and they tell you, I have no symptom. I, I have few of these patients in my clinic, and for them, going on a gluten-free diet is, is, would be a nightmare. But actually, studies have shown that these patients, even those patients, uh, when they go on gluten-free diet, they feel better. The quality of life is better. They overall feel healthier. And they start noticing uh, things that bothered them before that got better, and they, they thought it was part of normal life. So since it's so cool and so good to be on gluten-free diet, why is it hard? I don't want to hear from you. Why, why, do you, why is it hard to stick with gluten-free? So you're, you're trying to be part of a, you know, it's to be social. You're part of your community. Your friends are out, and you don't find something to, to eat. What else? Pasta. Pasta. Cost, okay, so it costs more. Sometimes it doesn't taste as good, all right? And it costs more, what else? Yeah. Right. Okay, so you don't wanna be rude, say no, I'm not eating your food. You have the anxiety, what if, you know, there's cross contamination and you don't wanna look like the weird person who's picky about what they're eating, right? Right. Right. So cross-contamination at home, if you're preparing different meals for yourself or for the rest of the family, or if you're out at a restaurant and, and being sure that the gluten-free meal has been prepared in a truly separate area than other foods. Right. 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 
So you want to go out, you want to be relaxed and have a nice meal, and instead you're anxious about things and you're asking, and, and maybe people around you are wondering why you're making such a big deal out of it, right? Okay. Well, you're going to tell them I might, right? Okay, okay, all right. So many good reasons, right? So there's many good reasons why it's hard to keep it up. And sometimes also just cutting down on some gluten makes you feel better and you feel you don't need to cut down completely. Not any, no, nobody in this room, you guys are the perfect celiac patient. That's why you're here. But this is what happened. And when you, when, when also you, when you're young, when you're, when, when you're uh, in your teenager years, it becomes more difficult to really be strict. Um, all right, so let's talk about what happens if we're not pure, very strict about our gluten-free diet. So of course, if you eat or smell gluten and you develop horrible symptoms, chances are you're not gonna eat gluten, right? But there are more subtle things that happen for people who don't have major symptoms, or you might um, not have major symptoms by eating a little bit of gluten, but it can affect your small bowel, keep it inflamed, and cause problems. One is malnutrition and not being able to absorb vitamins and, and minerals. And the, one of the most common one is iron deficiency. So if you look at patients with iron deficiency, up to 10% of them actually have celiac. And 20% of patients who have iron deficiency that does not respond to oral iron supplement have celiac. So looking at that in the other, in another aspect, you know, I've had a patient actually where the only symptom of celiac was, was anemia. She was sent to me for iron deficiency anemia. They wanted me to make sure she doesn't have a colon cancer or, or GI blood loss. Everything was normal, but the biopsy were positive for celiac and her blood test. Well, she goes, you know, I don't have any other symptoms. I might just well take some iron pills and that would be easier for me than being on gluten-free diet. Well, if your small bowel is damaged, your iron is not going to be absorbed. And being iron deficient can cause a lot of problems, including fatigue and, and cardiovascular problems and hair loss and all kind of things. So it's important. Abnormal liver enzyme. I've had a kid like this. That's the only thing he had, abnormal liver enzyme. He's like, as long as you don't tell me I have to be on gluten-free and I need to stop drinking, I'm fine. He was going to college. Well, so he's probably going to have to do both because if that inflammation in the liver persists, that can lead to chronic liver disease with all the consequences of liver disease. But the good news is that this is reversible with a strict gluten-free diet. Bone density. This is an important problem. So usually... Um, you know, you hear about osteoporosis in women who are menopausal or uh, older men. It's very rare to see it in young people. When we see it in young people, we have to think about celiac disease. And osteoporosis and osteopenia occur at higher frequency in patients with celiac disease. But the good news is it's reversible. So even in people who are diagnosed with celiac just on base of osteoporosis, they had no other symptoms, they presented with osteoporosis, we look for celiac disease. At the end of the one year with gluten-free diet, the bone mineral density uh, was normal again, which is great news. We don't need drugs for that. You, there are drugs for, for patients with osteoporosis that have potential side effects, but just being on gluten-free reversed the process. In children, adolescents who had celiac disease and had osteoporosis, it, they also, this was reversible, but it needs several years to be re reversible. The bone does not turn over and get better quickly. So again, that means that we have to stick to our gluten-free diet. Just you know, being on gluten-free diet most of the time does not, uh, does not do it. Neurological manifestation. I've had a patient, he came to me, he's a young patient, he had diarrhea forever. He was told he has IBS, he was not diagnosed. We diagnosed him with celiac disease. The one thing he was mostly happy about, he said, I'm in a much better mood, my wife loves me again, and I'm not irritable. But some neurological symptoms actually don't get better. So if we get them, and we, we continue to eat gluten-free, uh, gluten-containing uh, diet, some neurological symptoms will not get better, including imbalanced gait or feeling burning and tingling in the, in the hands and, and feet. So these don't get better. Women health, if untreated or undertreated celiac disease, increase the risk of infertility. Or if a woman is pregnant and the celiac is undertreated or unrecognized, there's an increased risk of prematurity for the baby or fetal loss or or the baby being born with a low birth weight. And this obviously has negative consequences on uh, the baby health. And finally, I wanna to touch upon malignancy and I'll stop there. Anything in our body that we continuously irritate that increases the risk of cancer, right? If you had multiple sunburn, you increase the risk of skin cancer. If you have your smoker, you increase the risk of lung cancer. Same thing happened in small bowel. 
If you trigger that inflammation by introducing on and off gluten in your diet, that can increase risk of lymphoma of the small bowel, but also other cancer of the GI tract. The good news is that this is reversible, after, but it's after being a few years on gluten-free diet. So you have to stick with your diet to prevent this potential complication of lymphoma, all right? I'm gonna stop there. There maybe we'll, we'll have questions that will address other things. Thank you.